Tuesday, April 13th, 2021. Um, we have additions, so do I have a motion? I moved. Have a second? I'll second. All right, we have a first by Mr. Lawrence, second by Mr. Gines. All in favor? 5-0 with Mr. Deming and Mr. Glaving out of the room. To our consent agenda, we're adding 5-I, resolution authorizing and approving entry into positive pay services agreement with the People's Bank. We're also adding item 5J, resolution to adjust compensation for the legislative department. Amend, amend, amend. Uh, have a first, do I have a second? Second. Mr. Gines, first Mr. Lawrence, second Mr. Gines. All in favor? Okay, 5-0. We will now move to our presentation agenda. And before we move to the mayor's report, I'd like to recognize Lucy Brazier, our council clerk. Today will be her last meeting as clerk after serving the city for 37 years. She's retiring. We'd like to All right. Thank you. Really appreciate it. All right. Thank you for your service. We'll now move to the mayor's report. Thank you, Mr. President. Before I okay, welcome everyone to our council meeting, and also uh, before I introduce the host of the Susan Hunt Show, we'll uh, we'll get fun with that. But I do we'll appreciate everybody being here, and I think uh, uh, everybody is uh, feeling I think the positive feeling that we have in Biloxi, and, and we're looking forward to the to the next 12 months to uh, to see uh, where our city will will go and and uh, the experiences we'll have. So, but let me begin by introducing our host, Susan Hunt. <laughs> hey, Susan. You gonna get Martha and Lisa up here? Can I do this? Can, uh, Lisa Wall, Martha Tripp, Marcus Bugo, Dr. Nelson, hurry up, please. <laughs> Thank you, time. Be safe, be safe, be safe. This is our coalition for Black Seek Cell by Five, along with Dr. Nelson and Marcus Bugo. Thank you. Okay, Ms. Hunt. Whereas the city of Biloxi, Biloxi Excel by Five, and other local organizations, in conjunction with the National Association for Education of the Young Children, are celebrating the Week of the Young Child, April 24 to 28, 2021. <laughs> these, these, uh, okay. <laughs> These organizations are working to improve early learning opportunities, including early literacy programs that can provide a foundation of learning for children in Biloxi. Whereas teachers and others who make a difference in the lives of young children in Biloxi deserve thanks and recognition. Whereas public policies that support early learning for all young children are crucial to young children's future. Now therefore, I, Andrew Fofo Gillich, Mayor of Biloxi, Mississippi, do hereby proclaim the week of April 10, 2000. 21. 21. <laughs> the week of the young child. Susan? Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Got a photo op? Okay, wait. Put this photo op, there you go. I got I'll get it to my Wait, I'll do it. Let me turn around. There you okay. Go. Thank you. Susan, I know you're not at a loss for work. I'm not. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you so very much. And I hope you all enjoy your bread. Thank you so much. I hope you enjoy your bread, and I'm coming next week so you'll get some more, okay? <laughs> all right, well, at this time, what I'd like to do, uh, first of all, I'd like to thank the city so very, very much for all your support and everything that you do in helping Biloxi Excel by Five. At this time, I am going to call some of our child care centers and schools that were able to come. I'm sure you all know they, it's kind of tough right now. Um, they're looking for folks that would like to have, that would like to work with young people. And of course, it was kind of lunchtime, so they, <laughs> they couldn't. So they will get their certificates. So what I'd like to do is, when I call your, the name of your center or your school, if you will come up and yeah, and go we'll give them, and we'll give them to. Mayor Gillich, and he will give you your certificate. Uh, Gulf Coast Center for Nonviolence, incredible years. 
Therapeutic Preschool, Alicia Tarrant. They were in order. Right there. Right there, right, right here. Right there. She's got the long one. Well, yeah, let's just do a group picture. Okay, Keisha Child Development Center, Mary Parker and Anita Himes. Do you see Caterpillar? I don't see her Caterpillar. Okay. Okay, what is this? Oh, he's sorry. Little Blessings Learning Center, Andrea Timms. <laughs> Little TP, Bruxy High School Child Development Center, Dr. McDaniel and Cheryl Smith. Nichols Elementary, Julian Langlinays. <laughs> North Bay Elementary, Ashton Manacruso. Yes. I've been practicing. She got a queen oh, thing on. <laughs> Pop. North oh, North, oh, I had, I gave you the wrong one. I pulled the wrong one. And Biloxi Public Schools, Dr. Melanie Nelson and Marcus Boudreau, our superintendent. Thank you very much. Now we can do a group picture. And thank you for you all being here. They didn't come. And for all that you do. I appreciate it very, very much. Thank y'all very much. All right, one more great proclamation. I'll ask Jefferson Tanner and Marcia to come up here, and I want to read this proclamation on a great occasion. Now, Chevis, I got to say, there's a word in this proclamation I've never said uh, before. Okay. It's the most difficult I've ever had. So. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm going to try it, okay? Whereas the people of Biloxi, People's Bank of Biloxi, has been in continuous operation since its opening on April 13, 1896. And whereas throughout its existence, the People Bank's, People's Bank has contributed to the growth, culture, and prosperity of Biloxi in the Mississippi Gulf Coast. The People's Bank is marking a milestone with its quasi quincentennial. I've never heard of it. That's 125 years. <laughs> That's pretty difficult. Yeah, huh? it is, it is. <laughs> anyway, uh, whereas through much, uh, though much has changed over the last 125 years, the People's Bank, much like the city, has exhibited a resiliency that has been has seen through challenges in natural disasters. Now, therefore, I, Andrew Fofo Gillich, Mayor of Biloxi, Mississippi, in honor of the 125th anniversary of the People's Bank, 
do hereby proclaim the 13th day of April, 2021, as the People's Bank Day. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. We'd like to sort of thank everybody. Uh, today is the bank's birthday, and today we are 125 years old. Amen. <laughs> I am the third generation to be president of the bank, and Hopefully on my left is the fourth generation to be president of the bank. We are gonna try and do something uh, special for the birthday and we were gonna replace the indoor outdoor carpet on the front of the bank steps there and as we pulled up the carpet, you, as you go up the steps, inlaid is the name Harrison County Bank. That bank uh, started construction in 1913 was completed in 1914. It never opened its doors, and the People's Bank, who used to be at the Elsie Building across the street, moved into that building in 1914. Uh, so it's uh, very interesting. I think I was the only person at the bank left that knew it said Harrison County Bank on those steps. But we've operated out of that location since 1914. If you get a chance, you might want to come by and stop and take a look at some of Biloxi's history. You want to say anything? <laughs> Thank you, Chavis. I appreciate everything you've done. I've got one more special presentation, and I asked Lucy to come up here. Lucy, time passes when you're having fun, right? So with, it's a great honor to read you this proclamation, this declaration. Whereas, after more than 37 years of faithful and professional service to the city of Biloxi and her citizens, Karen Lucy Brazier has decided to begin the next chapter of her life, retirement. Whereas Lucy began her career with the city of Biloxi on February 27, 1984, in the planning office of the Community Development Department. Then she was promoted to, as clerk of council in August 7, 1989, I was gonna say 1789, <laughs> where, where, she was de where she has devoted her time and energy to the council office and to the many council members whom has, have served our city over the years. Once retired, Lucy plans to spend her time with her three children, Brandon, Bass, and Abby, two grandchildren, Anna Kate and Poppy. Now therefore, I, Andrew Fofo Gillich, Mayor of Biloxi, Mississippi, in honor of her years of great service and on the occasion of her retirement with the city, do hereby proclaim Tuesday, April 13, 2021, as Karen Lucy Brazier Day. <laughs> Oh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. yeah do a groupie, that's right. Well, I'd just like to say thank you, Mayor, for this um, wonderful um, honor. And uh, I would like to thank my wonderful bosses again for the opportunity to, to work with them all these years. And I look out and see many faces of co workers, which we are really just family. And it's just been a real blessing to be able to work towards our city becoming what we hope it's going to be. Thank you all. And thank you to my girls who, who are my back. <laughs> thank you. Come on. Come on, girls. Come on, girls.
again, uh, congratulations to all that have been honored with certificates and the things that they've done throughout uh, the course of life in Biloxi. So we're honored to have all, and honor each and every one of them. And I believe that concludes my report. All right. Do you have anything? All right. We'll now move to departmental reports. I don't believe we have any of those. Or we do. Okay. Chief Miller. Yeah, I was just going to tell you a little bit about this past weekend and spring break. Just a short report. Uh, as you know, the weather uh, played a big factor in how many people were here. Mostly what we saw were, were I say, local people from Louisiana and Alabama, people that are a day away. Uh, we had probably between two and 3,000 visitors here. Uh, naturally, Saturday, with the weather dampened everything. Uh, so sat, uh, Saturday night, uh, we saw quite a few in, in uh, Club Zodiac. It was a full house until about 4 o'clock that morning. Uh, and then Sunday turned out to be a nice day, so we had a lot of folks out Sunday. But again, total about probably close to 3,000 people was all. Not a lot of trouble. We did encounter about uh, 40, 40 guns uh, from the visitors that were here. Uh, nothing too extreme. Uh, there were several arrests made, but for the most part, it was a, a pretty decent weekend. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Chief. All right, any other departmental reports? If not, we'll move to council reports. We'll start with Dr. Tisdale. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, I wanted to compliment the police department. It was a small crowd, and I think the chief would tell you they always prepare for the worst, hope for the best. It's a, it's a trite phrase, but that, that's really what they have to do every, every year. Good job, chief, and, and Captain Dykes. I know this was his first sojourn in this spring break with the traffic and everything. Um, the lighting on the Pops Ferry Bridge, it, I know we were waiting on parts. Is that... I, I asked yesterday, and I was told there are three out still. Okay. And um, cemetery, are we getting any closer to finalizing uh, the plots? Just because I've had people ask me, they're interested in purchasing plots. Are we, we getting any closer to, I know we, we I think, approved the plot, but we are talking about the regs on the, on the cemetery. So are, are we kind of getting to the point where we could let folks know they're for sale? Are we getting any closer to that? Peter? On the cemetery, you said? Yeah, I, I mean, are we getting any closer to resolving whatever issues there are? I, I believe we have the last version of uh, revisions that uh, we, could, we could put that on within the next few weeks, I believe. Okay, but I, and as I said, I'm just, I know I have people asking me, I'd like to be buried, you know, buried in the cemetery and as soon as the lots are available, yada, yada, yada. So okay. thanks, I appreciate that. Okay. That's all I have. Thank you, Mr. President. All right, thank you, Mr. Tisdell. Ms. Newman. Ms. Lucy, it's so surreal this is going to be your last day. I mean, you took us all in. We were all five new at the time eight years ago, and you've been there for us, and it's going to be so surreal not to see your lovely face anymore, but it's well-deserved, and we'll miss you. Thank you, Ms. Newman. Mr. Lawrence? Yeah, I've been a councilman lucky enough to serve with her for 20 years, so she trained me well. She's a good boss. She's actually been the boss, not me, so I'll thank her for that. A uh, couple things I wanted to check with the uh, the Sweatman House, have y'all got any information back from the state? Yes. Have y'all tried to get any information? No, don't give me that option. Have y'all actually contacted them again? The government's been contacted. No, because I mean, this is something you need to move on and get done. What you're trying to work to do is a good thing, so let's get it done. You don't have overnight. Yeah, so no more, no, no more slowing down. And Peter, we're about to keep the circle. Have you got a call back from the people that actually picked up the property? No, so we passed the option. Now we're in discussions. I like that. Maybe we're getting closer. That's it. You sure? Yeah, that's it. Yeah, we just <laughs> that's up today. Yeah. Push your luck. <laughs> we got to the discussions, and that gave good. We Thank you, Mr. Options. Lawrence. We did well. That's mm -hmm. a good thing. Mr. Deming. 
<laughs> you wasn't ready? I'm he not was shocked. He was still so good. Good. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, Paul already covered the Pop Cherry Bridge lighting, and we talk every week about the causeway repairs. Um, so if you'd send me an email, I don't want to beleaguer the point by dragging on every week and forcing you to give me an update of no update. So just Talk about the, the, the direct causeway, um, the sections that fell over during correct during the tropical storm crystal oh. ball. We got a quote for um, uh, from Seymour Engineering about A, removing the damaged sections and B, building the back. And we, we just haven't done anything about that yet. Okay. Uh, I mean, it's, I think that the, uh, I think, the, well, let me, I don't mean not, not say what I think the mayor thinks. Maybe I better let him say what he thinks. Well, I did, you know, <laughs> review that, and we have some ideas. Again, we made a, no, a number of, uh, uh, had a number of conversations with FEMA and MEMA on what can be done. And I don't know if you know the structure of that pier. It's got one piling and, some, and cantilever stuff. Um, it's my opinion it, that we need to do a little bit of something different. You know, we can do it fast. We can maybe cut down some things to uh, get the use, and maybe instead of having one complete section, it'll be easy enough to open, you know, 60% of that walkway space, you know, sort of rapidly. Uh, and I haven't had any conversations with Seymour and these other ones, but, you know, we don't want to do the same thing because it's not a very, you know, durable structure as it sits. So, you know, uh, it'll, it, it may take a few weeks longer to get a plan and then to get it approved and go forward. But, you know, whether it cost us money or whether it cost, you know, whether we get some reimbursement, we want it to be sustainable as, as some of the other structures like the Lighthouse Pier on some of the things we're doing engineering wise. But uh, I did inspect it a couple of times over the last few weeks. Thank you. And if you keep just, Mike, have me send me an email if anything changes. So I don't have to keep, I'll ask you every week, but if something comes up, please yeah. forward it to me so I can stay up to date do. Um, and do. keep everybody else up to date in my ward. Um, lastly, speechless. I don't know what to say. I know that Lucy was, and, and so were the other council women that we, I mean, uh, the clerks that we have, they've been amazing over the past eight years. I know that they've, they've, talked with us through the hard times. They've dealt with us when we've given them hard times. And you know, one of my favorite memories about city council is when Lucy announced the issues and then walked out mm -hmm. and told us we were idiots as a, <laughs> as a citizen. And I paraphrase, because she didn't call us idiots, but she meant it. Um, we, 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 were, we, were, we, were, we were attempting to do something that I think she disagreed with. And in all fairness, she is a citizen of the city and has the right to speak. And, and I'll never forget the day that she walked out and said, as a citizen, this is what I think. And so- It wasn't I, anything like Neanderthal, anything like that. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I appreciate the past eight years, um, and I hope you look forward to the next eight without us. That's all I have. All right. Thank you, Mr. Dimon. Mr. Glavin? Yeah, I, I, you know, I have to start off by uh, recognizing uh, Lucy Brazier. You know, anytime we need a, a work request turned in, she's promptly does it with professional care and accuracy and uh, to support uh, all of our city council uh, leaders and, and we greatly are in your debt for, for, for that, um, first and foremost. Also, you know, my wife and her uh, are involved with, and my mother-in-law too, are involved with the Garden Club so uh, you actually contribute to the beautification of our city uh, through your efforts. And if there's any one person that epitomizes working for a better Biloxi, it's Lucy Brazier. And we thank you very, very much. Um, Chief, uh, I'd also like to echo a uh, job well done this weekend. Uh, and listen, we welcomed uh, our spring breakers. Uh, the, the hotels did very well and uh, the, the safety and traffic was managed really well as well. And uh, I'm sure we'll have many, many more events and uh, we'll, we'll watch those red cones come up and for, for you and uh, your team to do your good work. Thank you for that. Um, also, I uh, do have the map uh, that the administration provided for a new light uh, for a bus stop. Uh, I met with um, 
some of the residents on Wetzel, we've kind of selected, uh, I think, what works. There is a little dark corner. This will light that up for the buses when they come and pick up the children in that area. And uh, so I'll submit that, Mike, uh, to you after this meeting concludes. And uh, that ends my report. Thank you. I'm sorry. Thank you, Mr. Glavin. Mr. Gines? Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, I'd like to start off. Um, Walt, I would like to set up a meeting Monday with you. Uh, some of the things I asked for last week so we can go over it and I can get a um, timetable to get back with the citizens uh, that asked those questions. So I appreciate that. Monday, usually about a regular time, about 9, 30, 10. Um, the other thing is, um, Mr. Leonard, uh, uh, the Nixon Street Railroad crossing, just where, where are we at on that? It's closed. It's closed, is it? But is it? And, there, and the barricades are up. The ba barriers are up. What about shaving it down and making it look? Are they done with it? Well, what we had to do was we had to remove the asphalt from the, the roadbed up to the, uh, the, uh, cross, the actual crossing. We did that on both sides. And then we had to put the barricades up. Um, and then, of course, what uh, CSX is responsible for is to removing any signals. Now, as I recall, at Nixon Street, there aren't any signals to remove. I think there were at Dory's, though. Okay. But both, both of those are officially closed now. But if there's, if there's some, shall we say, landscaping that we need to do? Landscaping, curbing, things like that. Those are the things that, you know, we talked about when we initially did it and the timetable of making sure we mm -hmm. have it totally completed. Mm -hmm. At this point, it's not totally completed yeah, yet. There, there's yeah. a, a section that, uh, as looking at some reporting from the engineering, there's a section of about 200 feet that has no curve on the south yeah. side, and it needs to be dressed up and may do some things. But there, w there was a drainage issue on how that land sits, and and they, there was right, some they, interaction with if we put a curve there, we'd have to do some more drainage. So we may, instead of doing a curve, have it a, a dress sort of concrete looking like, you know, uh, the rest of the the, the, the walkway and the, the side. Uh, so we do have some work to do there. Right. But there's some engineering that has to be done, and we're in the middle of that. Because we initially had a April, and that was one of the things that we didn't want it to prolong you know, forever. The, the, to go ahead it's and, usable. It's just we need to, you know, to, to finish it. We need to do something with that it, area right. without the curving. But there was an engineering uh, uh, feature that needed to be taken care of that we may put complete the whole, like I said, 200, uh, 200 feet of thing. Right, what they did, uh, no Councilman, the, in order to keep the cost down to and not have to put in additional drainage structures that were not there originally, they sloped the roadway so that the water would run into the ditch on the track side. So if we decide to put curb there, we're gonna have to Figure do something about how, how do we catch the water. We can't, but can't put the curb to block the water, so I, we need I'm thinking to. We can, without putting a curb, we can do some things to let the water go, but look as if it, you know, it, it was a, a. Right, and, and I understand that. Mm -hmm. you know, the thing was the timetable we, when we initially mm -hmm. talked about it. We just wanted to make sure it was something that could be done and right. completed. As okay. you know, we had an infrastructure a thing that went on and on and on, yeah. and I just well, don't want it well to. Well, the roadway's open. Yeah. The roadway's open, yeah. and the, and and the I, crossings are closed. And I understand that it's open, but, you know, finished product. We want it to look good, mm -hmm. beautifying, yeah. you know, the neighborhood. We got new streets. Yeah. We want to continue to uh, keep that going. I think that... Um, that really dressed up that roadway. Really dressed up the the, the properties that face the railroad track. Now it just seems like it's right. they're neater now. Yeah, and it looks good. Mm -hmm. But you know, but having those barriers there and those big old things. If mm -hmm. if we go ahead and clean it up, beautify it, put the curving down, and get the engineering issues done. Mm -hmm. And like I said, you know, uh, mm -hmm. I think we talked about when we initially talked about it. We talked about April having it finished and just didn't want it to drag out mm -hmm. past the end of the year or into next year. Mm -hmm. And so that's that's the issue that I was uh, having. Okay. So if I could get a completion date on it, I'd appreciate it. That's all. Um, okay, uh, and last but not least, um, I wanna address Miss Lucy. 
I just wanted to say thank you. Uh, all the eight years that, that I've been here, uh, you taught me a whole lot, uh, especially when uh, I, I've, I've always asked for special requests like uh, NBC Leo with the Black Caucus and different things like that. And Lucy, you knew all the details of how to do that. So the girls that's coming up, have, gonna, they're gonna have a tall order. But I appreciate everything you did, paving the way and making it easy for us to do our job. So thank you again. So you don't drop right off the road. That concludes my report. All right. Thank you, Mr. Gines. Um, I have just a few things. I'd like to start by once again thanking Lucy. I've only been here four years, but I remember <clears throat> right after I got elected, and it was well, I didn't have a, a general election opponent, and well before I um, was coming into office, Lucy reached out to me, and. Um, you know, wanted to make sure that I was acclimated to everything as, as much as possible and, and really helped over the last four years. So thank you so much. Um, secondly, um, I was out of town, but this past weekend we had a, a, a significant rain event. I think that's what we call them. And luckily, um, we had closed Shriners and cut Shriners like a couple of days before and uh, I know the old TNN building, which is now um, Strayum Electrical, um, got two inches of water in one of their warehouses, or maybe six inches. But had we not cut that road when we did, we probably would have had six or eight foot of water in those buildings. Not just that, but all of those those um, buildings surrounding that. So we dodged a bullet there. But with that being said, we have a lot of areas um, that dr um, drains are clogged culverts are clogged from debris that's been on, you know, not big debris, but stuff that's been put in ditches to be picked up from Zeta that has washed down just the small stuff that's left on the ground. And a lot of those culverts and stuff are not draining right. And we had a lot of areas and I have multiple pictures and I just got back yesterday's why I haven't sent them in yet, but multiple pictures of, of areas that, that had an, an unbelievable amount of water that doesn't normally have anything, you know, close to what it was. And so once again, you know, I want to stress the importance of being able to get us a vacuum truck in the north to where we can, you know, instead of having to wait, we can get these culverts cleaned out. Um, and, and I know it's not something we can do today, but whenever we do get to budget, uh, that's something that I think is is very important for you know my ward, Robert's ward, Kenny's ward, to where we don't have to wait on that truck whenever we have problems arise, and they can get a system to where they go through, clean them all out, and instead of having a bunch of them, if we have an issue, we can just go fix it. Let, let me kind of update on what's going on. There's a 985 million dollar uh, uh, COVID uh, bill, but there's also 1.5 million billion uh, coming down that for water and sewer. We're waiting on a uh, this is according to the MML and some of the things that were reported to us. Water and sewer will be, you know, the, the people who have the water and sewer projects and we hope stormwater or, storm, or drainage. We're getting some clarification. So there may be an opportunity soon, more sooner than later to pick up those kinds of things that would, you know, enhance our position to address some of these uh, emergency or non-standard kind of things with additional equipment, wells, uh, and, and those kinds of things that may be, uh, uh, coming our way. But, okay. Uh, that's high on our radar, and Mike has, has noted that, uh, you know, we have a, I think we have a, a, a drainage plan, a master plan that has been done. Yes. And uh, so we'll, as funding is, a, is allowed, we'll, we'll be rocking and rolling. You know, the more ready we are, the more likely we'll get that, that money. So it's going to be specifically for water and sewer, and we hope storm drain too. Okay. Yeah, uh, just to add, one of the things that the council asked about some time back uh, and that the mayor has recently addressed with me when we went through that will market master plan and looked at that 50 million dollars worth of projects that are listed in there in priority order the mayor told me he wants a west biloxi master plan just like that so we were in discussions with an a e firm earlier today about how to how to get started on that Okay. Mm -hmm. And then one last thing on the on that drainage, right there on Shriners. In the past, we've always had to worry about the the um, the businesses on the west side 
of Shriners flooding because it backed up. Now that that's opened up, and hopefully it flows like it did the other day to um, prevent flooding in the future, but there was more water backing up on the Around east Shriners. side of Shriners as well because it was coming through so quick, and it may be in the plan, but that, um, that drainage area that goes through and wraps around and crosses under Wool Market Road has a, a lot of growth in it. And um, if possible, if funds are still in that project, if it's not already planned on being done, I'd like to see us clear that out to where we don't risk those businesses on the east side so much coming through there quick that it backs up onto them. Because in the past, that hasn't been an issue, but it got really close this time. Right because it was coming through there so fast. Um, moving on, um, the park, uh, Eagle Point Park, uh, they had started setting um, and pouring slabs for basketball court, pickleball court, uh, pavilions and things this week. So we're nearing, um, you know, we're seeing the light at the end of the tunnel as far as getting to the end of that. And I uh, um, see that Representative Felcher's in the room and the state has assisted greatly on that through Tidelands funds and um, helped us out this time on some title and stuff. So I'd like to thank you and um, our local representation for helping us out on that. Um, tomorrow, we have a, uh, or I'm sorry, not tomorrow, on Thursday, 5.30, we have a ribbon cutting at the Woolmarket City Center, followed by a ward meeting around six o'clock. So if uh, department heads, if you're available to be there to give us an update on um, Ward 7, uh, that would be great. And um, then the last thing that I would like to add, and I don't know if y'all are aware of this or not, but I heard that whenever they get done doing the repairs on the Fort Bayou Bridge in Ocean Springs, that I-110 is next. And I don't know if that's um, true or not, but I heard that there's gonna be a time when, I don't know, portions or all of that's gonna be shut down. And so I don't know if we have some type of <laughs> contingency plan, but um, I hear that that's the next. We build a new Pops Ferry Bridge. Yeah, I hear that that's the next step, and I know that that's causing nightmares not only for businesses but for people having to leave, you know, hour early, um, traffic being backed up, getting on and off of the interstate, and so on. So that might be something we need to look into. So that's all I have. Nathan. Yes, sir. I like to bring up one more thing. I know you could raise his day. I think we definitely all seven of us should close this meeting in her honor. I agree. So uh, all these things we do this all the time, she definitely deserves thirty seven years to put up with anybody. That's amazing. Thank yeah. y'all. All right. We'll now move to our policy agenda. I'm s sorry. Well, no, we won't. We will now move to citizen comments. We will uh, allow three minutes per po person, total allotted time of 45 minutes. Um, and if you would like to speak when you come forward, if you will state your name and please sign in at the table. Do I have anyone on my left side of the room and your right side of the room that would like to speak? My left side, your right side? My right side, your left side. Anyone that would like to speak? Or is there anyone in the back of the room? All right, please come forward, state your name, and sign in at the table, please. Yes, my name is Diani Kirschman, and um, I'm here to represent Biloxi Shores, just in case if there may be any questions towards. Could you questions. could you move a little closer to the oh, microphone? Sure, sure. I'm sorry. And state your name again for us, please. Yes, my name is Diani Kirschman, and I'm here to represent um, Biloxi Shores just in case if there may be any questions in regards or requests. Okay, mm -hmm. thank you. Okay. All right, are there any other citizen comments? All right, if not, citizen comments are closed. We will now move to the policy agenda. And I'm going to step out of the room and Mr. Tisdale's going to handle this. Ordinance, ordinance amending chapter 20 of the Code of Ordinances by adding Article 4, Operations of Low Speed Vehicles, previously moved by Councilman Lawrence and seconded by Councilman Glavin. Uh, thank you. Um, Mr. Abad, I think you, did you give the council members a copy of that handout already? Yes, everybody should have that proposed text change. This is to clarify the violations uh, 
probably the primary violations will be folks, uh, underage drivers or uh, people driving without the decal. And this is just to clarify, if you commit any of those violations, you would also be subject to a violation and a fine. It was a, it was a little confusing the way the, the other paragraph read. So I would ask that this be added as, a, uh, as an amendment at this point. Or I'll point. move to add that amendment as a motion by Mr. Glavin to amend the uh, proposed ordinance as noted. That's item G by Attorney Abide. Is there a second? Second. Second by Mr. Lawrence. Discussion? Mr. There Glavin, is. any discussion? Nope. Mr. Lawrence, any discussion? On the amendment. I On the amendment. What we're doing here is putting it into effect, and we'll probably be adjusting it as we go along. Right, well, will be changed, and so once you right now, this is just for the amendment to add right, that language. That's and we'll right, come it's back an amendment it. for a reason. That's what mm -hmm. they put in effect the violation. Yeah. All these things will be adjusted as we go along, just like anything else. So you put them in effect, and then see how they work in a program. Sure. That's all. Okay, thank you, Mr. Lawrence. Mr. Daring, did you have a question? Yeah, the only concern I have is potential confusion as written. Um, because it says maybe operated, if the language were to use terminology like only or the problem is it's not clear to some readers because I've been contacted that you can't operate them on 35 mile an hour roads. So if we put in here some, pro some obvious prohibition instead of saying they can be driven on this road and they're allowed to proceed over roads that are 35, I just think the way it's written isn't clear enough for non-government officials or attorneys right. you know it's, uh, we we will have a map and a pdf map showing uh all roads in the city that are 25 mile an hour speed limits will show if you're crossing uh one of the larger roads will show where the traffic lights are and certain areas where we think there may be a propensity to kind of go across, but there's not a traffic light there. We're going to try to highlight those areas to show that that you should not you should not cross in these areas. So, uh, then, but you're talking about the actual text saying that. Uh, so, for example, allowed. if we and this is just looking at it briefly to give this idea, but in subsection A, section 20-4-2, subsection A, which says low speed vehicles may be operated on city streets and roads where the speed limit is 25 miles per hour below, can we just put the word only? May only be operated on city streets in which the speed limit is 25 miles an hour or below? Yes, that'd, that'd be fine. Yeah, I, I would like to add that to the amendment if... That's fine. So that's item A. We're going to add the word only after the word may so that it reads low speed vehicles may only be operated and so forth. On city correct. streets, correct, where the speed limit is posted. All right, do we need a, to vote on, are there any other additions? I have, I have a question also. Okay, let's, so, let, and then we'll add all these at the end. Go ahead, yeah, Mr. Gaines. So, so, so when we're talking 25 miles per hour or less, are we going to issue a booklet or, or something showing uh, the streets that are, that are eligible to be driven on? Right, we're going to have this on the website, and we're also going to uh, hand a map to those persons at the time of their registration. Uh, and we're also going to have certain wards blown up. If they're in a certain area, it's going to help them to say, well, here's the downtown area. This is the, uh, this is the sun kissed area. So we're going to try to make that as, as friendly as possible so they can understand that. But, you know, for example, if you are if you're where the Oaks are at Sunkist on the east side of Poffs Ferry and you were wanting to go over to Sunkist or to go to Yule's, the place to do that would be at the Sunkist Country Club Light. So the map would kind of show in that area, uh, we would have green showing the roads that are okay, uh, areas where you're not supposed to cross, we could put those in red. You know, and this is, we're kind of doing a working progress on the map right now. Because, you know, 
if, if you put it on the website, most people are not going to look on the website. But if you put it in their hands, if you put a booklet in their hands, Ward 1 through 7, at the time of registration, then you uh, kill all the, uh, right. the, all the issues that people will have. So and that's, the, that's what I'm asking. At the time of registration, I mean, that's a, that's a great point. At the time of registration, we would give them the map and have them acknowledge they've received the map and that they're aware of the ordinance. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? I have any idea on the timeline for the map several weeks from now? Could be a month. I, the, well, the state, the, the, well, the, the statute that the governor signed takes effect July 1st? It's actually, it's actually in effect now. Uh, we, with unanimous, it could, we could roll out fairly quickly. Uh, okay. So, but I'd say certainly within, within 30 days, we should have everything ready to go. Right, because that'll, that'll be the next question if we're waiting on the map. So uh, maybe mid-May, we may be actually uh, having some of these vehicles and right. inspected with maps and, and so forth. Or we'll coordinate with the police on how to do the inspections. We have to get the decals printed. So there's some nuts and bolts that we're taking care of right now. Now, okay. Uh, one more question. Who Mr. would Guy. this be administered through the police department? Right. The police department, by by the statute and by our ordinance, the police department will be in charge of the inspections. And if you have your information, you bring to the police department your uh, driver's license and your proof of insurance, and then and your application fee, and then you would get the decal at the police station. Gotcha. Thank you. Any other questions? So we, in, in looking at our amendment to change the language on page one under item A, low speed vehicles may only be operated on any city streets and roads, et cetera. And then on the second page, item G, as noted by Mr. A, by operating a low speed vehicle without a decal, an expired decal, or in violation of section 20-4-2 shall constitute a violation, et cetera. We have a motion by Mr. Glavin to amend this and a second by Mr. Lawrence. Any further discussion? There being none, all in favor of the amendment. That's a 6-0 vote with Mr. Barrett out of the room. Now we'll vote on the amended ordinance. Uh, we've got a motion by Mr. Lawrence, a second by Mr. Glavin. Uh, let me ask, is there any discussion on the, on the remainder of the ordinance? Just a couple Mr. questions. Deming. Uh, Chief, if you may, I know when we, we had a slugfest about the motor vehicle for hire situation and the burden it put on the police department, what do you, the numbers um, for these low speed vehicles, how much of a burden is it going to put on the police department? There'll be a little bit of a learning curve at first, but I, I suspect that that'll, that'll dissipate pretty quick. Okay. You know, we did, we used to do the same thing, like you said, with motor vehicle for hire. We did the inspections on the taxis, and so, like, it'll take a little while, but we'll, we'll get it down. All right. Thank you. Anything else? Any other discussion? All right. We'll call for the question. All in favor? None opposed. That's a 6-0 vote. Uh, perfect timing, Mr. Barrett. Thank you. We'll now move to item B, resolutions on the agenda. Resolution appointing Carrie L. Campbell as clerk of council. I'll make that motion. All right, we have a first by myself. I'll second. Second by Ms. Newman. Oh. All right, is there any discussion? I didn't hear. Any discussion? All in favor? Seven zero. Resol oh, yes. Congratulations, Kerry Campbell. <laughs> Resolution appointing Tanner Cook as Deputy Clerk of the Council. I'll make that motion. motion. Okay, I'll second. But first by Mr. Gunns, I'll second the motion. Is there any discussion? Is Tanner here? 
He is not. Mr. Tisdale? Yeah, just one quick comment. I, and uh, I circulated this a little earlier, I, I believe, to all the other council members. Uh, Mr. Cook, Tanner Cook, is an excellent guy, does a great job where, where he is now, uh, all indications. I would prefer that the council finish this fiscal year uh, with just uh, the two clerks that we have to see if we can better manage that, not better manage, but see if they can handle the load uh, and that maybe we re-examine adding or filling this vacant clerk spot uh, when we start talking about budget in the next fiscal year. I want to make it clear it's just about the position itself. It has nothing to do with the gentleman that's being considered. Okay. Thank you. All right. Any other discussion? All right. I'll call for the question. All in favor? Six to one. Thank you. Mr. Tisdale in opposition. All right. Item D. Resolution to grant conditional use approval for short-term rental for property identified as 263 Eisenhower Drive, Unit 61. All right, this was previously moved by Mr. Gla uh, Glavin, seconded by Mr. Gines. So do we have any discussion? I don't have any discussion, no. Okay, Mr. Gines. No further discussion. I'm in favor of the Planning Commission. Okay, Mr. Tisdale. Yes, as, as I mentioned at our, our last council meeting, I just have an issue with flipping individual units and apartment complexes to short-term rentals. Um, I, I worry about the ramifications and, and what they might be in the future. We have a number of apartment complexes throughout the city, and uh, I, I just think we're really opening a can of worms without considering other factors before we make decisions like this. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Mr. Tisdale. Any other discussion? Yes. My problem with this is I see no upside for the city, none. I see a problem when you take in apartments who have built on the different stand than hotels and turn them into hotels. So to my, my knowledge, the best thing to do, anybody wants to turn these apartments into short-term rentals, then they need to follow the code that's set up for hotels. The other problem I have is a fire department, we have 304 days of these. We're going to have to have extra firemen to go around inspecting all this stuff. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to call on Joe Boning, who does this with the fire department, and explain to you all the problems that has been created with these short-term rentals. Joe? Thank you. Just like everybody else, uh, the Planning Commission and y'all, We've had challenges with this uh, short-term rentals as well in the fire department. And, uh, you know, we, I um, proposed to the city council, to the, uh, the mayor and Mr. Leonard at the last director's meeting that we were getting close to the point where we need to look at getting another inspector to inspect these buildings. So we're reaching that saturation level already in the fire department as, well, as far as inspection of these uh, properties. But a bigger issue for us, and, and just like, you know, and, and I'm sure Jerry has, has run across it as well, is when we, when we start taking apartment complexes and, and flipping them into short-term rentals, it doesn't match the fire codes like we would like it to. And this is not just in Biloxi. This is all over the country. We're having these issues. Um, you know, a hotel is an R occupancy a hotel or a motel. They're required to be sprinklered. Um, these short-term rentals in, in the fire department's eyes or the fire service's eyes, these are the same thing. They're transients. Uh, these are transients' uh, occupancies. People come in, they're not aware of the facilities of their surroundings like a, a permanent apartment complex is. Apartments are built for a specific occupancy. Hotels are built for another specific occupancy. Our issue is fire, is, is fire protection. 
in these facilities when you change the occupancy type. And that's where we're having a lot of issue. Every time I have, I cringe every time you come up here and talk about changing a hotel, I mean a, a, an apartment complex or a condominium into a short-term rental because I know they're not designed or built with the fire protection systems in place to provide the protection to these citizens. So um, that's, that's the, the best short way I can, I can explain it to you. Um, you know, as far as residents go, changing a residence to a short-term rental, the council approved, uh, uh, decided to not to require residents to be sprinkler for short-term rental use. Uh, I understand that, I get that, um, but when we start changing these larger facilities into, into hotels, essentially, um, without the protective systems in place, we're asking for disaster from the fire department standpoint. <laughs> Thank you. All right. You have uh, anything else, Mr. Lawrence? Uh, just thank you for that information. And I think everybody needs to pay attention to the problem that we actually getting ready to create with these apartment buildings. And I think if we're gonna do this, then we need to make sure they follow the fire code to protect the people that's living there. And also to protect the people that's coming in and out. You know, you can't party in your house every weekend and tear up and pretty soon you're gonna burn it down, mess it up. And when the people come in, and I don't, you know, they come in, they have a great time in the city of Bluxy, but they're here for a weekend. And that's not the purpose of these apartments. These apartments are built for long term, long term residency. So I just have a deep problem with that, and I agree with the chief. I think it's something that's not going to work well in a long term apartment, turning them into hotels, basically. Thank you. Any other discussion? Yes. Uh, as I said, last week i'm in favor of this and i support the planning commission's decision which was a unanimous decision in support of this as well um, a couple of things that strike me is that this is still a conditional use and there are specific parameters that this one adheres to that not every every apartment adheres to this is a, a part and parcel separate building this is a little bit different than any just any apartment complex so when we take these specific considerations um, to determine whether we're going to approve or deny i don't think that's arbitrary or capricious and i think this fits within the parameters of everything we wanted um, secondly when you say there's no benefit to this, well, the taxation is the same or increased because you still get the, the ad form of the property taxes, plus you get some forms of uh, hotel taxes. Not to mention that, there's a, bigger, there's a bigger benefit to the city in the economic multiplier. So when you look at the studies, and I've done the studies on this this past week, a permanent resident of a, of a hotel versus a 60% occupancy of a, what the chief called the transient, we see, we see a three times economic value multiplier. They spend more money in the economy and more money in the community every time they go out into the community than a, than a long-term resident of a hotel. So there's a huge benefit. That's a three and a half times more of a benefit to Biloxi than, it, than using it as an apartment complex. So that, that argument is futile at best, but this one, as we've seen all of these apartment complexes come before us and we've, we've approved and denied, and I don't think we've had one that's come with a unanimous decision or unanimous support from the Planning Commission. And it's, and it's because this one, rightfully so, fits the criteria that we've espoused is important to the city of Biloxi for passage. So um, I'm in full support. That's all I have. Mr. Tisdow, go ahead. Given that comment, um, Mr. Deming, I'm thinking, all right, how many apartment complexes do we have in the city? Are they large complexes, small complexes? If there's that much money to be made, then I'd be crazy not to start buying up apartment complexes, large, large or small, and flipping them to short-term rentals. I mean, from a purely economic standpoint, wouldn't you agree? I think you'd agree. I think where you're going is you're also in favor of buying and building your own apartment complex for all the displaced people from all the short-term rentals. Is that where you're going with this? No. Okay. It's just, it seems to be if you're gonna park your money, if you're gonna park your money somewhere, 
I'd start buying duplexes or fourplexes or small apartment complexes and start flipping them to short-term rentals. Until the market's so saturated that there isn't a benefit, right? So you still exactly. have to understand that there's there's for, there's market forces that apply to both sides of this argument. Sure. There are always market forces that apply. It's but no, I said I wouldn't go there, so I won't go there. So I think I think we can look forward to more apartment complexes being flipped to short-term rentals, certainly more units. But also, I wouldn't be surprised if, if we're looking at entire complexes going that route. And based on what the fire chief said, that creates a lot of safety issues because the construction's a little bit different, I believe, if I understood you correctly, chief. So, <clears throat> and that's why I say maybe, if nothing else, we should either uh, not approve this or table it and give this a little further thought into the future and plan for how we're going to make this transition. It's coming. coming. Could be, could be a couple of months. Could be a couple of years. But based on what I heard, it's coming. Ooh, it looks like we're going to have more discussion. Always a good sign. <laughs> I knew we couldn't get away with Thank this. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. All right, Mr. Glavin. Yes, I, I have a question for the chief. Um, chief, would would um, if we start approving these structures that don't have the same protections that maybe hotels or, or other entities have, could that compromise our fire rating eventually? Absolutely, it, it affects the fire rating. It, it, it will certainly affect the fire rating, depending on the, the amount. I understand. Yeah. But if, if we continue to There's do this, of it, affecting it, it could right. put in jeopardy our fire rating and yes. make insurance rates go up for commercial and, right. and residential businesses. Okay, thank you. I wanted to just clarify that. Mr. Gines. Uh, yeah, uh, we tabled this um, a week ago so that everyone can get a chance to look at the maps and look at how things were located. And there were three issues that came up which made me in favor of it. Um, one, does it fit the context? Yes. Two, we, we looked at the map and we saw that it stood alone. The other thing is, it's a conditional use. Unanimous vote, 13-0. The Planning Commission, Planning Commission generally gets it right. And in this case, I think they got it right, and I'm going to support it. Thank you. All right. I, I wasn't here last week, so I do have a couple of questions. The first is for Jerry, um, Mr. Creel. Um, when it comes to apartment complexes, isn't there some kind of language that only allows a certain amount of units within a complex to be turned into um, into short-term rentals? No, sir. Not anymore. Is that condominium? Uh, so that's removed. Yeah. So that's no. Okay. That, that's all I have on that. And then, Mr. Uh, Boney, do whenever you say that this could affect our um, fire rating, so would that be affected? simply on the merit that we approved um, short-term rentals in apartment complexes, or would it have to be because of incidents that occurred because of that? It, that's right. It, it, simply because you approve a short-term rental doesn't, that will not affect it. And, and, and most probably, if you did like this, it wouldn't affect it, a, a, a small number. But when you get into a full complex, and these inspections are um, reviewed by the state. If it shows they are that these buildings were apartment complexes built for apartment complexes, but now are short-term rentals being used as short-term rentals, um, that violates the fire code, and that's where you have the issue. Okay. Now my next question is this. Um, and I know we've covered this before, but just to refresh my memory, the difference in code, and this may be a, a Mr. Krill question, but the mm -hmm. difference in code outside of the sprinkler system and the exit signs um, in a hotel versus an apartment complex are what? The difference in, in, in a hotel and a motel, they're required a to hotel, have a, Hotel and apartment. Okay, okay. And, and I'm sorry, a hotel and an apartment complex. The difference is in the codes, they are considered, and Jerry, you can correct me if I'm wrong, they are considered a transient occupancy R, correct. 
these are required to have fire alarms, okay. smoke detectors, and and uh, um, sprinkler systems uh, in them. Hmm? The alarm. Wire right, the right. That's what I said. Fire alarms, the smoke detectors in the rooms, and uh, fire suppression system. Smoke detect. Uh, so sprinkler, a sprinkler system. system then. Yes, sir. Okay, so that's the three differences. An apartment complex that is not required to have okay. these things. All right. And then um, what, what? Peter. Yeah. And then one other question. Do we have any instances in the city of one of these that have been converted of um, an instance happening, a, a fire in, in a, a converted? Um, no, no, not, not in. I think the only one it was, was the... Uh, the the what? No, that wasn't a short-term rental. Would would be the one on the beach that 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 was a condo, and they changed it to the to the short-term rentals. The old Saxon, the old Saxony apartments. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. Okay. And then one other question: How long have we had ordinances? And this is for Mr. Creel. Thank you, Mr. Benny. How long have we had ordinances in place regarding short-term rentals in the city? I know it's it's not a it's not a uh, an old issue. I, so. I went back and looked at, okay, short-term rental, the title, came out with our land development ordinance in 2010. Correct. So it was listed as a use in there, but it really didn't become an issue until about 2015, and I was going back through the records the other day where we had had a lot of our discussion about short-term rentals in 20, the latter part of 2014 and just about all of 2015. Okay. All right. Is there any other discussion? So we'd actually just start approving these in the uh, 2018. We didn't have any short-term rentals before 2018. We went through that discussion for over a year before we ever passed any of them. So there's no short-term rentals legally in the city of Biloxi before 2018. Yeah, we were we were receiving applications, and and you know it was new to all of us, and so it was kind of a learning experience for for everybody. Uh, the, and uh, the, the question the questions here about short-term rental is, is uh, along with what Joe had said, is looking at it from different perspectives. You know, if someone comes in with a set of plans to the department and they're going to build an apartment complex and turn it into short-term rental, then that works for us because we had the ability, both my department and the fire department had the ability to review those plans like a hotel and we can make sure that the, the safeguards are in there. It's when we're taking an existing structure and that was built under a code, and in this case, these particular apartments were built in 1974, so they were built under a much inferior code. Now, the, the general part of that is um, if we have an apartment complex where people are having to walk long distances to get to an exit, to get outside the building. That's one thing to be considered. And, and converting an existing building over to that, then we're gonna to have to make sure some safeguards are in place. Now in these, this particular complex, the building that we're talking about is in the middle of the complex and it has eight units. It has four on the bottom and four on the top. Now. The, the complex is not sprinklered, which it wouldn't have had to have been back in 1974. But the two units come directly out into a breezeway that immediately comes out into the open, which is one of the things both my department and the fire department have to consider. How long does it take for someone in there in the event that there's an emergency, how long does it take them to get out of the burning building and out to a public way? And in this particular case, both of the units are on the bottom floor, and they're probably 15 feet from being totally outside the building. They also all, both of the units have patio doors that serve as a secondary means of egress to get out too. So you, the discussion we've had so far seems to be to lump everything in together. But one of the reasons it's important to look at this as a conditional use application is because you can take the specifics of each particular unit and the way that it's been presented. Is it new construction? Is it an existing building being converted? And then take the specifics of that existing building being converted and, and consider that 
as part of it. So, so. director, why don't we require short-term rentals to have the same conditions that a, a hotel or motel would have? The, why don't the, we write that in? The code assumes, the, the, the building code and the fire code assumes that a person who lives in an apartment complex is familiar with the exits, is familiar with the path of travel, the means of egress to get to the nearest public way coming outside the building. I'm talking about short-term rentals. Which is yeah. a hotel. I'll get to right. that now. Okay. It assumes that the people that come to stay there are not familiar with the means of egress and not familiar with the quickest way to get to the means of egress. So the requirements for a hotel are a lot different. And just to, just to correct something that um, was said a while ago, City Council didn't vote to remove the sprinkler requirement from apartments. What the council voted to do was to remove the requirement for conduit, for metal conduit going into an apartment complex. So buildings still have to be sprinklered when they reach a certain size. But uh, they are allowed to be wired with Romex now, and that was the change that the council made to the code. Okay, I have one other question, which isn't relevant in this situation, but just to clarify, if someone did come forward and request to rezone an entire unit to short-term, a, a, a complex to short-term rental, would they not be required to bring it up to that code to have it sprinkled, to have the, the um, alarm system, to have the exit signs and all that if it was an entire unit? versus one that's the that's the way that we would look at it uh, okay. and joe and i have talked about this before that uh, if, if someone either comes in with a set of plans or someone comes in to convert an entire complex then we're going to take what we call the existing building code which covers building code requirements and fire code requirements and we're going to apply all of the safety features that we can to that so in regards to what mr glavin just asked if they were to convert an entire complex, they would have the same requirements as a hotel. It would be, except that we get into a degree of difficulty if there's something inside the wall that, okay. that we, I mean, okay. we're not going to make them pull the sheetrock okay. off the walls and go in and redo everything inside of there. And I think that's what Joe was kind of alluding to a while ago. It's very, very difficult to take an existing building that was built under a previous code and bring it totally up to the code that we have adopted. Now, too many things have changed since then and now. Okay, all right, that's all I have. Any other? Yeah, uh, Jerry, those uh, two apartments that we're talking about, are they attached to the buildings? Are they attached to the building? Yeah. This is, this no, one I'm building. Talking about, you're talking about your funny feet, uh, wait, are they attached to this project? The rest of these buildings are attached to these buildings. If you look at if you look at the map that's in your packet, there are four large buildings that make up the perimeter of the property. In the inside, in the in the courtyard area, there's a swimming pool. Then there's the leasing office to the west of it, and then there's this one building that has eight units in it. So it's all part of the complex. It's not too freestanding. No, oh, sir. It's not freestanding. No, sir. That's the first thing. Okay. And going back to Take an apartment. You can, you're not going to take an apartment and turn it into what we need to do with the fire department. You can't do that. Like you said, that, you're talking about have to tear thing down and start all over. That's why they're doing what they're doing. So they don't have to sprinkle. They don't have to do these things. And they take them one at a time to do it. So, I mean, that's, that's the problem you have doing it. It's, you know, everybody made it sound like these were two apartments that are all by themselves. They're not. There's eight of them. So you're just going to happen? You're going to have eight of them before you believe looking for the same thing. That's, that's that. The other thing, I just wanted to respond to what uh, Robert said. Thank you, Jerry. Okay. I don't know where you got the three and a half percent times the money. You can't tell me anybody's gonna bring more money than somebody that lives in the city of Bluxy for a whole year. That ain't gonna happen. What you, what you, Wait a minute, let, I'm, you, I didn't interrupt you. You come up with three and a half percent, I don't know where that come from. Three and a half times whatever somebody else spent. I don't believe that at all because it had not affected our tax roll, if that's the case. And we have 348 short-term rentals, and over half of them don't even account for the city of Bluxy. They're not even in the city of Bluxy. The taxes goes to the Gupport, it goes to North Carolina, it goes to South Carolina, it goes everywhere, not in the city of Bluxy. So it's not helping us. There's no upside to short-term rentals, period. 
David, can I just respond to one thing? When I said a three times multiply, I think what you're confusing is a I'm person. Not confused at all. Well, let me finish. Okay. <laughs> but you didn't cut me off. Right. Interrupt me. So, a person that lives in an apartment for a whole year versus somebody that's in the apartment for two days. Anecdotally, when I go somewhere on vacation and I'm staying in a hotel for two days, I go out every day into the environment and spend money. However, when I'm here at home, I may go out once on the weekend, but all the other five days, I sit at home and I don't spend money in the economy. But if somebody were in my house, if I were in a hotel every single day, so the, the three times multiplier comes from having somebody vacationing every single day in that home, not going out once a weekend or once a week or once every two weeks. The people that are in that home for the entire year are going out every single day into the economy, spending money on, on food, supplies, utilities, um, and, and entertainment, whereas we sit at home and don't go out every single day. That's where a three times multiplier comes from. And it's not me just saying it anecdotally. This is math and science. This, this is real numbers. Well, let me ask you one question. Those five days that you don't go out, is that all free for you? No, you have to go eat. You got to pay gas. You got to buy gas in your car. You got to go to the grocery store. So them five days, that's pretty moot point right there. No, that's not. Because I go to the grocery yeah. store once a you week. You live here seven days. You're spending money seven days a week, one way or the other. Do you want to look at my food bills compared to my restaurant bills? Because if I go to the grocery store and I buy food to cook for two weeks, it's much cheaper than going to a restaurant every single night, which I would do if I were in somebody's hotel or house on vacation. Anyways, think what you want to think. I have, I have facts on my side. Yeah, Thank I, mean, you. I, I don't believe your facts because I don't know where they come from. Newman, Ms. Newman. Yes, I would like to hear from the applicant. I think she probably has some things to say since she's overhearing all of this. Um, and maybe perhaps hear why she wants to do these short term rentals in these little apartment complex. Yeah, once more, my name is Diani Kirschman, and thank you for the opportunity to be here to share with you all. And in response to your question, um, one of the main reasons why we decided to, to make this decision specifically in the- Speak closer to the mic, please. Yeah, sure. You gotta get it recorded. Okay. One of the reasons why we did take the decision to maybe start doing this um, Airbnb is because, well, last year COVID, a lot of stuff changed for us. And these four build, this, this building that have eight apartments are the ones that really move the slowest. If you visit my property at this moment, you will see that those two units, they has been just in pause for more than, for more than one year approximately. Um, and that's the only building where we have, these are the two beds, two baths. They're really hard to get rent for us. So we just see this as an opportunity, you know, to offer something because of our location and, and well, to see if we could get it work out. Basically, that's what moves us towards it. At this moment, we have four units that has been vacant for almost, almost the full, full year. Mm -hmm. Are you going to rent the other eight as short-term rentals? Sorry? You got, eight, you got eight sitting in that one set of buildings. Eight I have apartments. eight on that building. Right. Are yes. you going to turn all of them into short-term rentals? No, to be honest, we are not projecting to, as I mentioned in our first intervention, um, basically we're thinking just on the first on the first flooring, which it would be four units. Yeah, but if those mm -hmm. first two go well, you will turn the rest of them into short-term rentals. There's no doubt about that. I mean, there's no reason not to. Uh, so far, right. so right. far, we do not yeah. have it in mind. Yeah, and I mean, I'm just being honest so far. So hmm. I got a, I got a question from Ms. All right, Mr. Glavin. Ms. Kirschman. Yes, sir. So th these units that you desire to be short term rentals, if you did have a long term tenant, would you consider mm -hmm. renting it to a long term tenant? Yes, of course. Okay. Yes, of course. All right. Thank you. Mr. Tisdale? Yes. There you go. Mm -hmm. Question. Aren't these, isn't this complex being renovated currently? Yes. Would it be possible then if, because we we're talking about fire code and so forth, mm -hmm. on these two particular units, mm -hmm. is it possible during this renovation to 
meet the higher code requirements that the police chief was concerned about? If it is required, if, if what we have at this point, uh, we are missing something, then I think that it will be possible for us to try to work it out. As I mentioned, those unit, we have four that has been for more than one year. I've been here in Biloxi almost three years, and I'm not gonna lie to you. The unit 61 and the unit 67, I came and it have not been rented since then. Right. That's one of the reasons why we thought about maybe just transition to something else. <laughs> if you walk in that unit compared to the other ones, you're gonna see that we really went into a different standard. Like, like we definitely demolished everything and just went to a different standard. Right, so are, are you in the middle of this demolition that you might be able to upgrade these to meet the code requirements that the, the fire chief has concerns about? I don't know where you are in the process. I, I, I realized in driving by that they were being renovated, which is a good yeah, thing. Yeah, we get it renovated. Mm -hmm. But I, I just don't know where you are in the demolition process for these two bedroom apartments. And they're the only two of those eight that are two bedrooms, yeah, correct? Yeah, we have, we have two of them that is already fully renovated. I was listening clearly to the requirements that he was mentioning. And I think that uh, basically the only thing that we will be missing maybe will be the sprinklers. It will be because that was something that we were not aware of and we, I'm not going to lie to you, we, I didn't know sure. it was required, but we, we tried to follow up. Sure. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right, I'll call for the question. All in favor? All opposed? Four to three with Mr. Glavin, Mr. Tisdale, and Mr. Lawrence opposed. Yep, thank you. We'll now move to resolution E. Resolution to grant conditional use approval for a short-term rental for property situated at 263 Eisenhower Drive, Unit 67. This is moved by Sam. Deming and Lawrence. All okay, right, this is moved by Mr. Deming and Mr. Lawrence. Any discussion? This is just an extension of what we just did. Yeah. Correct. Any further discussion? All right, call for the question. All in favor? All opposed? All right. Four to three with Mr. Glavin, Mr. Tisdale, and Mr. Lawrence opposed. We'll now move to the consent agenda. I have a request to go to executive session. I need a motion and a second to go into closed session. So moved. I'll second. All right. For the purpose of examining the necessity to go into executive session to discuss personnel matters. All in favor, we have a first by Mr. Move. Tisdale, second by Mr. Glavin. All in favor? <laughs> All opposed? Mr. Okay, six to one with Mr. Deming opposed. We have a first by Mr. Tisdale, second by Mr. Glavin, that the council conclude the closed session and reconvene as an opening meeting. All those in favor? All opposed? Six to one with Mr. Glavin and or Mr. Deming in opposition. Uh, Council Member Tisdale, Council Member Gines, second to that, that the Council go into executive session. All those in favor? All opposed? Six to one, Mr. Deming. We'll now go into executive session. <laughs> yeah. Felix Glavin. <laughs> I've become Glavin.
Yeah, just, uh, I'll, 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 I'll run it over. Yeah, I'll bring it as they come up. What are they supposed to call? Uh, the personnel is just there. What's that? Who works for me?
The floor hasn't been laid out yet. There are plants that were laid out. Peter? Is he in the mayor's office? Can you grab him for me, please?
You know, when I get a microphone in my hand, I don't want to sing. I'll make that motion. Discussion. Mr. Tisdale? Nothing. Ms. Newman? Mr. Lawrence? There's only one thing I'd like to move on, uh, Jay. I'd like to uh, put that on the table for amending it okay. and turn it over to the council president. All right. So you need to uh, second that. He has a, he's making um, a motion to amend, and we need a second. Anyone second that? I'll second. All right, we have a second. To amend, uh, okay. Uh, and those amendments by schedules. Mr. Lawrence is, um, for clerk of council, is $54,241.17. For the current deputy uh, clerk, $49,528.34. And for the new appointment for deputy clerk, $38,896. I have no discussion. Mr. Glavin, Mr. Gines, no discussion. All in favor of the consent agenda as amended? Uh, on that one, okay, I'm sorry. We have the first and we have a second. All in favor of the item J as amended? All opposed? Okay, six. To zero with Mr. Gines abstaining. All right, now we'll call for the question on the consent agenda. All in favor? All opposed? Seven zero. We'll now move to code enforcement hearings. You want to go up to that meeting? Yeah. Okay, I'll cover. Okay, that's fine. Items A, B, and C on the code enforcement agenda are all properties that are side by side. Yes, sir. So we, I'd recommend that y'all hear those at the same time or okay. consider those. Uh, the addresses are 0 Beach Boulevard, also 570 Beach Boulevard, and then 580 Beach Boulevard. And they're still in violation. to speak against Mr. Bodka's properties on 0, 570, and 580 Beach Boulevard. I, I just have a question for the director. Is that, what is that, storm debris? What, All of it is still storm debris from the hurricane. From Zeta? Yes, sir. From, okay. <clears throat> Any further discussion? All right, if not, this case is closed. Item D on the agenda, Mary Bowles, 540 Beach Boulevard. That case has been resolved. Item E on the agenda, Christiana Trust as custodian, 609 Peyton Drive. This one is still in violation. Is there anyone here to speak on behalf of Christina Trust?
is that the house is wide open and that there are uh, homeless people going in and out. There's no electricity there, and it, it's just being used as a shelter. The neighbors are pretty upset about it. One of them was actually here and, and left during the uh, executive session. But what we're requesting right now is to have it secured. And uh, since we've had no one to respond to any of our email, our documentation, certified mail, we may be coming back uh, later to ask for demolition. Okay. Can, can we board it up now? Is it? Uh, if, the, uh, if the city council votes on it, then that's what we would do is we would go out and actually secure it. Okay, thank you. We'll give this to All right. So is there anyone here to speak on behalf or against Christ Christiana Trust 609 Peyton Drive? If not, this case is closed. Next case. Okay. Uh, item F, Robert W. and Candace Gambrell, 2462 Pass Road. Originally, we were bringing this case to the city council for securing the structure. Uh, I met with the attorney that represents the Gambrells about a year ago, and he assured me that they were going to take care of it. The, the carnish all the way around the outside was open, and, and uh, animals were getting into it. Water was getting into it. He assured me that they would take care of it. I've heard nothing from him since, and during the hurricane, a tree fell and actually hit one corner of it and took it down. So what we're asking for today is demolition. Anyone here to speak on behalf or against Robert and Candace Gambrell, 2462 Pass Road? If not, this case is closed. Yeah. Next item. Item G, Sam Jones, uh, 170 Hannibal Court. Mr. Jones was here before the meeting, and there is some question about this particular tree. This has to do with a tree that fell across the fence. And Mr. Jones has raised a question about whether or not it was his tree or not. So I would ask for some time for us to go back and just verify that the tree uh, either- 30 days. Okay. Second. All right, we have a first by Mr. Gines, a second by Mr. Tisdale, all in favor? 6-0 with Mr. Deming out of the room. Okay, thank you. That concludes our code enforcement hearings. We'll now move to the routine agenda. Do I have a motion? To move. Second. First by Mr. Lawrence, second by Mr. Tisdale. Mr. Lawrence? I don't see anybody that tells about any money. You got Mr. L um, uh, Leonard's here? Leonard right here. Mike. <laughs> do you have any update with the money? I do. The $700,000 that uh, was due in last week did come in, and there's $1.2 million teed up in the system that we'll have sometime in the next two weeks. All right, thank you, appreciate that. All right, any further discussion? All right, all in favor? We have a 6-0 vote with Mr. Deming out of the room. How are we gonna close this meeting, Lucy? All right. I think we all, I think we all second that. We have a, a motion to recess in honor of 37 years of service by Miss Lucy. We have a first by Mr. Lawrence and seconded, first and seconded by everyone. Everybody. All right. Is it off yet? All in favor? Bingo. Think so. Everyone have a great day.